We have Carrie Hitt joining us from the National Offshore Wind and Research and Development Consortium, and she will be interviewing past grantees about their research and their technological advancements and how um, the consortium was able to support their development. Take it away, Carrie. Okay, hey everyone, uh, this is Carrie. I'm the executive director of um, what we call now RDC because it is a very long title. Uh, so thanks Amy for the intro. Um, what we're gonna do today for the next 45 minutes is uh, talk a little bit about the consortium and then my three guests who thank you so much you guys for joining um, are going to chat about their experience and how they've been able to take advantage of um, the program that we have to offer and um, kind of also talk a little bit substantively about the work that they're doing uh, with the funding that they've been awarded. So I'll just take a minute maybe and chat about the consortium. Um, we've been around now for about two years um, and really over the past year, um, despite you know all, all that we've all been dealing with, really taken off and are starting to achieve our mission. And the consortium was established through a competitive solicitation by DOE a few years back. Um, and NYSERDA, the New York Research and Development Authority, um, won that RFP um, to set up the consortium. And NYSERDA contributed about $20 million, as did DOE, to create an initial research and development fund for technological and research innovation in the offshore wind space. And uh, so the consortium um, has come onto its own now and is its own standalone 501c3. We still get that research funding from both of those institutions, as well as uh, a few states, um, Massachusetts, uh, Virginia, and Maryland contribute both from a cost share perspective with their facilities, but also with cash contributions for the research that we conduct. So they're really important participants in what we do. And we're really hoping that Rhode Island gets on board sometime soon as well. Um, and uh, I think I'll have another um, another offshore wind state uh, participating pretty soon. I can't say who it is yet, but pretty happy uh, that that will be happening probably this quarter. So um, we have state policy leads involved in what we do, um, but we also, in one of the, I think, unique aspects of the consortium is we um, really are uh, strategic focus and our solicitations and the research we focus on is driven by input from developers and from industry and academia working in this space. Um, but we have uh, around nine developers who actively participate in the consortium and help guide us. And we call them members. We have a board and they sit on the board, um, but they also uh, really help guide us through our research committee, which selects our topics and then helps us select our projects that we award. Um, also included in that are some names that might be familiar from the supply chain side, which would be GE, Hitachi, ABB, and uh, we have a couple of utilities as well. Uh, so really diverse group helping to um, identify what are key uh, innovations that are needed in offshore wind. The focus of the consortium is uh, right now kind of medium term. Um, so we look at projects that can deliver some um, education or product or strategy within the next three to five, seven years and have an impact on offshore wind within that time frame. Um, we may on occasion uh, award a project um, that contributes to a longer term scenario, but that's, that's pretty much what we're focused on. So just a couple more things. Um, we have run two large solicit, well, large from our perspective, um, two large solicitations each of about $9 million. Um, in the first round, uh, we made 20, award, we have awarded 20 projects. Um, and right now, two thirds of those are contracted. And you're gonna hear from three of those folks today um, who have awards um, and talk about uh, what they're working on and their experience with that. We also just concluded another solicitation um, with roughly $9 million in funding. It might be a bit more when it's all said and done. Um, and just this morning, I, I left my meeting early, we finished reviewing all 110 proposals we received for that, uh, which was massive amount of proposals. So what that tells us is there's so much interest in this space. Um, and I would say 99% of those are very high quality. So we had a really tough choice, a lot of tough choices to make, but on the other hand, um, there's so much innovation and development going on in the offshore wind space um, that um, it's really exciting, of course. And um, we're really, we'll be really excited to announce some of the awardees um, for that solicitation uh, in the coming weeks. Um, and for those of you that um, there might be a few people on the call who participate in that solicitation, uh, 
round one will be announced really soon. Uh, supposed to be announced sooner, but uh, we'll get that off the ground hopefully in the next week or two. And then the remaining awards will come in February. Uh, so really excited about that and to get those projects started as well. So, but I think what you really wanna hear about today is experience with some of our awardees and um, Amy already introduced them a little bit. We have Zach Miller from Triton who is not, oh, there you are Zach on my screen. Um, there's enough people that not everyone's on my screen right now. So, and I see Professor Hines from Tufts. Hi, and uh, Jin, are you on as well? Awesome. Hi, thanks for joining us fresh fresh back from vacation. So I uh, hope you had a good break, or I think it was a break anyway. Um, and uh, why don't we, I asked each of them to prepare just a couple remarks about the projects that they're doing first. And then we'll talk about a little bit about their experience with working with the consortium and some advice that they might have just in terms of um, working with the consortium, but also other entities out there that are interested in sponsoring projects in this space. So. Um, Professor Heinz, why don't we start with you? Because you're on my first row. <laughs> Certainly, happy to happy to start. And thank you, Carrie, and thank you to everyone here for hosting us today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? And do you mind if I just share a slide for a second, just to give a visual? That'd be great. Um, I'm excited to be speaking to folks in Rhode Island. Uh, this is a really exciting project and uh, uh, we are very grateful to now RDC for really providing us with what be is becoming the keystone of a much larger venture. And so the project is known as Optimal Sensor Placement for Physics-Based Digital Twins. As you all probably know, the United States has the most advanced machine learning technology in the world. One of the interesting things that's happening is that sometimes the machines are trying to learn without um, a physical basis to this. And so what we're working on here with the structures of the wind turbines is to make sure that this is very much grounded in physics in Isaac Newton's physics and the scientific revolution. And that we're also taking the best of the 21st century machine learning and pulling this together. This is on the Block Island wind farm. You see the team here. The team is co-led by uh, Tufts University and the University of Rhode Island. My colleague Chris, Chris Baxter at the University of Rhode Island uh, is leading a project right now to instrument the turbines. The now RDC project will then be advancing the analytical methods. And we also have partners in the United Kingdom, uh, Transmission Dynamics, RE Catapult, and Unisys who are working with us. They have separate money through Innovate UK, which is a partner organization of now RDC. Uh, they will be working on the seven megawatt Levin mouth turbine uh, in Scotland, and uh, the Block Island turbines are currently under uh, being monitored under a project from the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. So what the now RDC uh, funding has allowed us to do is to bring this project uh, to become a joint project between DOI, DOE, and the UK. These are all contractually separate projects, uh, but we are working on the same subject matter. And what this really is at stake here is, is that we don't wanna build these turbines and then accomplish the energy transition and then have to rip them out in 2050 because uh, they've reached the end of their life. And so the way that we keep these things, we design these as infrastructure, we make them last for 50 years or even hundred years is by keeping very close tabs on the stresses every second of every day uh, for the rest of their lifetimes. And these advanced methods and the data revolution are gonna be incredibly important to figuring out how to do this. But we're on the cutting edge of this right now and in Europe, we have a number of partners who see this, this new market in the United States as an opportunity to really start fresh uh, with really large 12 megawatt turbines and to monitor the fleets as a whole in a systematic way. And so we're creating the, uh, we're creating the technology that's gonna allow that to happen. And we're partnering with Orsted and GE right now. And we're very excited about what the next two years is going to bring in terms of bringing a lot of this technology and maturing it in the offshore wind industry. Awesome, thanks. And we'll we'll we're going to circle back to these and in, in each person. Um, Zach, do you want to go next? There you are. Sure. Hey. Well, well, thank you everybody for for having me here. Um, and let me talk about our program and, and now RDC. Uh, so, so Triton, we're a small business up in Massachusetts, and uh, we have been developing um, a new anchoring system for floating offshore wind uh, for about the past four years now. 
Um, somebody mentioned DOD earlier, so I will uh, say that originally our technology was designed for uh, removable causeways uh, for, for Navy DOD application. Um, and then it's been modified uh, and advanced um, for basically floating offshore wind. Um, so the main thing that we're doing over current uh, anchoring systems is improving uh, capacity ratings uh, by lowering costs um, and using innovative solutions there. Um, we are, our, the basis of our technology is around helical pile, uh, helical pile screw piles. Um, and so we're really focused on the, the serial nature of anchoring systems for floating offshore wind, rather than the one-off um, installations that like an oil and gas anchoring system might have. Um, so that's where we've been focusing a lot of our research and our, and our innovation and our technology. Um, you know, by working with now RDC, um, we've been able to advance our TRL level. Um, we will continue over the next uh, about year and a half, two years to continue to work with them under our funding agreement. Um, we actually currently have three separate funding agreements for our technology. So uh, the technology was originally funded um, and still is funded today uh, by Department of Energy through the SBIR, Small Business Innovative Research uh, Grants. And then now RDC is funding us. And then also uh, Massachusetts Clean Energy Center uh, through their Amplify grants um, have come on and helped us fund too. Um, so with all this funding, we're, we're able to um, basically finish all land-based uh, certification um, tasks. Uh, ABS, American Bureau of Shipping ha has come on and is going to certify our anchoring system. Um, and we're working with uh, several different industry partners um, and also two research institutes, um, University of Rhode Island Geotechnical Department, Aaron Bradshaw is helping us out. And then also uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst uh, Wind Energy Center uh, with uh, Sanjay and uh, Don DeGrat are helping us out. So we definitely have a combination of industry and research partners to help advance our technology um, under, under our three funding grants. Thanks, Zach. Jane, you want to go next and talk a little about what you're doing at GE? Absolutely. Can you Thanks. hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to be here today. I'm really thrilled to be among the other panelists and the hosts and in the audience. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Jing Li. I come from GE Research. Uh, we are the research center for GE businesses uh, located in the uh, capital region of New York. Um, what our project is about is characterizing offshore wind resources. So many of you may know that over the years, wind turbines become um, longer in, or the blades become longer and also they become taller. Um, and part of the reason that drives that is because as you, the higher up you go, the more abundant the wind resource. So the wind speed is gonna, gonna be higher. Um, and that scenario or, or that assumption is being used in wind turbine designs. And that includes not only the physical components, but also the control algorithms of wind turbines. However, that assumption can sometimes be violated. Um, as you go offshore, sometimes you encounter unique wind events. And the one that we are taking a look at in particular is called low level jets. So that is a type of wind event um, where the uh, wind speed maximum appears at a certain height. Um, and then both above and below the wind speed is actually um, lower. So we can imagine that uh, wind turbines experiencing that kind of wind profile um, that not being accounted for appropriately in the design can have problems. So you can deal with that in two ways. One, you either, um, you know, whenever we have physics that are not being adequately captured, um, we, we use safety factors. So that means you are giving away design space to account for that unknown impact on the wind turbine. Or you can, um, in, in the actual um, operation of the turbine, that would also mean that the control algorithms are not optimized to extract as much as possible the wind energy from that unique wind profile. And the reason um, that 
that type of phenomena has not been accurately uh, accounted for is partly because of a lack of data, um, observational data in uh, US offshore that allow us to get insights um, on these type of winds, and also partly because of a lack of modeling capability to accurately predict uh, and characterize that wind events. So what our project team is focused on is the letter thrust. So we are developing and demonstrating a uh, modeling capability to accurately capture um, low level jets. So it really essentially we use softwares as our computational wind tunnels um, to study uh, and capture those type of winds. And once uh, we demonstrate this novel computational method to, um, to, to capture these type of low level jets, then we also will be able to study how wind turbines respond to them and build upon that knowledge design better turbines, including better control algorithm um, to, to deal with that type of, uh, type of wind events. So our project team um, includes um, ourselves from G Research and also our sub-awardee um, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, based in uh, Colorado. Uh, we have experts um, on atmospheric sciences, um, high performance computing, um, wind farm modeling that um, collectively um, enabled by the funding provided by an RDC tackling this uh, this modeling challenge. Thanks a lot, Cheng. And, and that, uh, uh, well, all these projects are very complex as you can hear, and the challenges that we face in offshore wind are somewhat, you know, can be simple and complex, and some of the, and the solutions respond to those. Um, you did a really good job describing that in, in just a few minutes, something that, um, you know, in a way that everyone can understand, I think, which uh, it, it can be, you know, even, even for me who sees all these proposals and um, the nuances in many of the proposals that we see and the challenges that they're trying to tackle uh, is, is pretty fascinating. Um, and, I, I, you know, before we kind of ask, uh, I ask the panel the next kind of question, um, just a few observations, you know, uh, that the consortium, one of the things that we really try to focus on is uh, awarding projects that help lower um, LCOE, so the levelized cost of energy. And so some of these, um, not just the projects that you're hearing about today, but most of our projects um, in their proposals have really identified how they're going to lower costs by an improvement in uh, a piece of hardware or a methodology or a strategy or um, using data to better analyze systems and then address uh, address cost reduction through those means. So, one of our mission statements really is, you know, lowering cost. And it, it's a little bit esoteric in some ways because you know it's easy to say that, um, but many of our projects really tackle that in maybe a very narrow way. But the savings and the reductions are quite significant um, when you're talking about projects of this size and investments of this size, which are, as you all know, probably uh, you know in the billions and billions of dollars. Um, so the other, um, I just thought I'd mention that, um, the other thing which kind of leads to my next question is we heard a little bit uh, about the partners that are involved even in just a single project. And so I'd ask each one of you maybe to talk a little bit about that about, because um, I, I think, you know, what the Venture Capital uh, Cafe folks would like to hear about is, um, how did you go about, you know, how you go about putting those pieces together, um, you know, from a project funding standpoint, and then the partners on the technical and execution side too? You know, it, it might be obvious, but uh, to many, but um, I'm not so sure it is. In, and I've even seen that in the proposals we receive. Um, often we receive proposals that aren't very sophisticated. Uh, they might have a great idea, but they're not really sophisticated in putting the package together or the concept of um, how they're going to move forward. And it would be really helpful to, based on your experience. So whoever wants to go first, uh, we have different perspectives too. We have a research institution, an academic institution, and Zach from a smaller company, and Jing, of course, from GE. So each one of your perspectives would be helpful. I can yeah. take a stab at answering that. Um, as Carrie mentioned, um, many of the big problems and trends that we're seeing now in offshore wind and the challenges that need to be addressed um, to lower the, the cost of energy, they are complex and interdisciplinary in nature. So a lot of the, the problems, it's 
um, you really need to surround yourself with partners, um, with other research groups um, that have expertise that you do not necessarily have, but stronger, but you are stronger um, when you put those uh, uh, team members together that bring different perspectives and, and expertise to tackle um, a, a problem together. So I think it, it's super important for this project team to be able to access um, resources in um, the National Renewable Energy Lab through um, now our DC. Uh, we're able to um, put our minds together and put a strong proposal. Um, um, yeah, which, which, you know, without this opportunity, it will be very hard. Um, this, kind, this kind of collaboration will, will, be, hard, um, will, will, will be hard to, to take place. So yeah, I do think from from that uh, from that perspective, um, now our DC provides a unique um, a venue for for this uh, collaboration to happen. Zach or Eric, do you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah, I can uh, I can go ahead from from a small business perspective. Um, so so Triton does a lot of proposal RFP type stuff, um, and since we are a small business. Um, we do not have all expertise, and, and as um, was mentioned previously, a lot of these um, areas to lower LCOE are very complex and require a lot of different uh, engineering um, backgrounds and aspects. Um, you know, so internally at Triton, um, <clears throat> sorry, I feel like uh, we have the expertise from a subsea uh, engineering perspective. Um, but we're not geotechnical experts. Um, we've only been in per se the offshore wind market um, for about four four years now. Um, so we're you know we're looking for some mooring expertise to combine with that more uh, with our anchoring expertise. Um, and then since we've been working on this project, um, you know beyond the technical, you have to have a scope of work that obviously will will progress the product we're trying to build. So then we've partnered with a lot of industry. Um, a certification agency, um, you know, construction companies to help us do big tests, things like that. So, you know, we kind of have to pair technical expertise partners, but then also, you know, the execution, um, you know, scope of work type partners when you write these proposals. So you definitely have to look at the partner aspect um, for two different sides, um, you know, because Triton, we're, we're doing, we're actually building something, we're actually demonstrating something. So we have to make sure we, we think about both sides there. That's really helpful perspective. Just, um, you know, uh, I think you, you, most of you can probably discern that each of these projects is a little different. Someone might be working on software and data analysis, other projects that we've awarded, and we, we have a wide breadth of projects, might be uh, a, a piece of equipment or hardware, and it might be something big or small, uh, you know, that requires, um, not only a lot of engineering uh, expertise, but maybe a demonstration site, for example, or, or something like that. Um, another example is that's uh, a few of the projects that we have funded um, require access to a supercomputer to be able to um, run all the data and do the analytics. And that's a relationship that you have to have with the um, uh, entities and agencies that have those and access to them. So uh, Professor Hines, do you have anything to add from your perspective um, from Tufts? Yes, thank you. I'd like to echo what both of our colleagues have said, that you, you can't do work in this area without collaborating. Uh, it's simply too complicated and there are too many disciplines involved. Um, unique about the Block Island project is that this project actually goes back about eight years uh, to 2012. Uh, and this team is a team that has known each other for a long time and has been talking about these things. Uh, now our DC represented a very particular opportunity in terms of funding uh, to be able to bring together and catalyze all of these interests, all of these different um, threads that we've been following for a long time. Similarly, um, the Wood Oceanographic Institution, for instance, has now our DC funding uh, and we're collaborating with them on this project. Uh, if you sort of imagine very simply we need to understand what the wind, what the loads are on the wind turbines and how they affect the turbine. That, that might seem like a simple question, but it's an extremely complicated issue, uh, as you've heard others talk about here. Uh, and so the idea of monitoring the atmosphere, modeling the atmosphere, monitoring the turbines, modeling the turbines, keeping track of all this, this is driving ultimately at a very simple idea 
uh, which is what are the loads on the turbines? How do we keep track of them? Uh, because what happens is over time, they vibrate back and forth, you know, millions and hundreds of millions of times, and they eventually, uh, they eventually suffer under issues of fatigue, sort of like if you take a paper clip and bend it back and forth, you know, many times you can break it. So that's really the name of the game here is we have to keep track of these over years. Um, and I think that, you know, the other thing that's really interesting from a collaboration point of view is when you think about the investments that have been made in the last 10 years in the Wind Technology Testing Center in Massachusetts, the drivetrain testing facility in, at Clemson in South Carolina, the National Renewable Energy Lab, Sandia, uh, and then you think about the National Science Foundation labs. The United States has over $2 billion in existing research assets that uh, are relevant to offshore wind. And we think that one of the major projects of the next 10 years is uh, bringing these assets together, networking them together in many ways like the earthquake engineering community did 20 years ago and like the ocean sciences community did. And this is how we actually understand that the United States uh, is going to figure out how to join, you know, we're 25 years behind Europe, uh, but there are certain things that we bring to the table if we're able to collaborate and do this work together uh, that will put the United States squarely in the middle of the global energy market and, uh, and make us a very exciting collaborative partners with, uh, with our colleagues in Europe. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot. I think that's a really, um, it's a really good point to make and maybe to talk a, a tiny bit more about this morning or this afternoon now um, that, you know, you all said and, and that, and I, I had the same observation, these can be very complex projects. Um, but what we're trying to think about is, even though they're complex, um, we really want to encourage innovation um, from the smallest company, from you know the smallest research institution, all the way up to large ones like GE and others who you know have years of capability in this space. Um, innovation will come from any one of those forums, and I'm increasingly thinking about not how do we simplify this, but how do we ensure that we don't scare off or lose sight of some of the um, things that might be happening um, in smaller institutions that might not be as familiar. Uh, and, and Zach, I think your experience might allude to that too. You know, you start to look outside of maybe your traditional industry space or what you've done historically and see how that can apply to offshore wind. Um, and um, it's in our most recent round of proposals, We've seen a lot of collaboration um, from traditional oil and gas industry uh, with now the offshore wind industry, but it's only in its infancy, right? We've really just started. If for for some things, for others, it's it's you know there has been more historical track record. Uh, so I think that's great because that will help us take knowledge we already have to help lower those costs and actually foster innovation. So there's a couple of things at play here. You know, big companies or institutions and small institutions and making sure they get matched up. And some of your ideas, the folks that are on this call, you know, we're trying to think about how to make that happen better. Um, and then also um, really the institutions that you uh, alluded to, well, you all alluded to that exist here in the US um, that often have resources or knowledge that can be tapped um, to help some of these innovations be really practical and applicable uh, to what's really needed for offshore wind now. And so, um, um, we have a lot of engagement right now with National Renew Renewable Energy Labs and some of the other energy labs, um, research labs, excuse me. Uh, and I mentioned the states earlier that are involved uh, with the consortium right now. Um, we have cost shares with those states where they, with certain projects, might make their facilities available for if it's a testing facility, or they may make data available that they've been ga um, gathering on behalf of the state in the industry that's been happening there. So. Um, Good news, it's, it's, there are, they can be complex and the contracting can be quite complex uh, as well as we're finding and learning by doing. Um, and I'm hoping that in the future we can simplify some of that uh, for some of the entities that may not have the wherewithal uh, to do such complex contracting when you have all these different parts and moving pieces. So um, I had a couple questions um, and certainly um, one that I wanna ask our panelists too, but. I'll just uh, respond to a few that came in through the chat really quickly. Um, one was, um, do we have international funding or would we consider that from other resources? So for the consortium, um, absolutely. Um, we currently have an agreement, uh, an agreement, I guess, with Innovate UK. Uh, they are, uh, have some funds available to sponsor projects that make it through our current solicitation. 
um, and that they approve. They have their own approval process as well, but we're working together to identify projects that might uh, benefit um, both programs. That's one. And then I've been spending quite a bit of time talking to um, a few other um, research and funding opportunities, um, primarily from Europe at this point. So um, I hope to see some of those come to fruition this year. And then I had a, there was a question about IP uh, and how we handled that at the consortium. Um, the consortium is um, by its creation really a, a child of, I guess I would say, of DOE. And so our um, IP rules in part reflect what DOE might require. Um, and uh, they're, they're sort of complex, but really um, there are, uh, we look at each project individually and figure out how that's gonna work and how we can comply with what DOE requires for projects it funds. That's one thing, so I won't go into detail on that. Uh, but the second thing is, and really important, and the three folks on this call uh, or meeting know this as well, the consortium is also really about getting the information out that they're learning. Uh, so um, we, you know, part of our mission is over time as our projects unfold, we will be sharing whatever we can share with the broader offshore wind and investment community and all sorts of folks um, so that we all can learn from the innovations that are happening um, that we're sponsoring. So um, that's, that's really important to us and part of the contract um, that we have with each of our awardees. So I probably said enough. So let's move back to um, some other questions for our uh, uh, folks um, that have joined me this morning. So, um, you know, you talked a little bit about um, the funding that we provide, um, but what else, to the extent that you can share, how else do you think about funding your research projects, whether they're the ones uh, that you have under agreement with us right now? Um, what other resources or advice can you give um, to entities such as yourselves? You know, where should they look for um, funding, you know, uh, you know, a project that might become commercial or a research project? Um, Zach, do you want to start? Maybe we'll start with you this time. Do you have any advice on that? Yeah, um, so lots of advice. Um, so yeah, Triton, we're a small business. So there's a lot of uh, small business uh, grants opportunities through uh, mainly Department of Defense and Department of Energy, um, Department of Health Safety, NASA. Um, so we do a lot of SBIR grants. I would probably say 75% of the funding that Triton receives is, is SBIR or uh, also known as STTR. Um, so there's different uh, money differences there, but uh, basically those are the two main ones. Um, other things that we're finding out is a lot of state funded uh, stuff. So as I mentioned, you know, Massachusetts Clean Energy, um, there's a lot of um, like startup uh, type funding that's available through Massachusetts, um, things like Massachusetts Business Ventures or something like that. Um, and so that's kind of where we focus a, a lot of our, our, our focus is, is small business, you know, research funding. Uh, so, yeah. That's great. That's really helpful. Um, for, for Professor Hines, what about you? What do you, what do you guys think about? I mean, you, your approach is probably very different. Well, I, no, I do. I agree with Zach. I mean, the, um, state level funding to think about this. All, we think about all these research projects and packages uh, because I think that a lot of funding entities are interested in multiplying uh, the money that they're investing. And that also goes for private entities as well. So the work that we do is funded by uh, federal organizations, uh, by organizations such as now RDC, uh, by state level commitments and also by industry commitments. And so this comes back to this idea of how do you assemble a team uh, how does the team, uh, you know, decide to work together? And also we're, we're realizing that when you, you know, you put that kind of work together and the kind of problems we're looking at, when you really think about innovation, you need a sustained approach to a problem over time. And so stability mm -hmm. uh, is also important. And the other key aspect of innovation is that there's a lot of things that we already know that are in different fields that haven't been brought to bear yet on offshore wind. And in that particular instance, I think, again, this, this question of putting together teams and as you say, Kerry, giving access to folks is really important. And in this particular case, uh, earthquake engineering is an illustrative example because as I mentioned, we have a network of labs formed 20 years ago by the National Science Foundation for earthquake engineering. 
one of the other things that happened during that time was that it used to be you couldn't do any testing in a lab if you didn't own the lab. But what the National Earthquake Engineering Simulation Network did was it gave access uh, to institutions without a lab uh, to do research in a lab. And so this was really a great uh, democratic move forward in terms of opening up the field to new ideas. And, and I think that we're seeing the same thing in offshore wind. Uh, and so I think that uh, it's really important for uh, you know, people to be open to uh, funding coming from a variety of sources. What's exciting about offshore wind is the sheer number and diversity of people involved. I mean, it, earthquake engineering pales in comparison uh, to the diversity you know, that we see in offshore wind. And so I think that's uh, it's very exciting to watch that coming together. Jing, what about you? Do you have anything to add in terms of how you um, how you think about it, and uh, you know, from a GE perspective, which is different, I think, but um, might be sure. Useful. Yeah, so I think how we approach um, decisions to make investments in technology innovation is we 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 look at the technology roadmap. Uh, in this case for renewable energy or for offshore wind, and identify those that are. Uh, relatively mature um, versus those that are early stage R&D. For the first ones, it probably makes sense for the business to, to directly invest in those technology development. And but for the other type, uh, when those R&D projects are still too risky to justify uh, business investment, then we look outside for external founding opportunities or uh, other partnership uh, um, uh, venues. And um, yeah, so in this case, I think this may also resonate um, with many of the audiences is when, when you have a, compa a compelling idea um, that really makes sense, makes sense to you and, and your team. I think next step you would want to do is identify um, sources of funding and also look at um, the big problems and trends in the space as identified by the experts and see whether you have an alignment. So you would want to check out like roadmaps. Uh, I, I think now our DC put out some uh, roadmap reports um, as well as other agencies like the Wind Energy Technology Office uh, was in DOE. Um, they published um, outlook re reports and identify areas of research needs to drive on, um, either drive on cost of energy or identify barriers of technology um, uh, um, ad adoption. So you want to look at those reports and try to align. And whenever you see an alignment, that's, that's a good um, sign that you know you would have a I guess a high probability of of getting funding and you know and then go for that opportunity and put a put a strong proposal together and then in terms of specific founding um, streams that I, I don't have anything new to add um, we have now our DC um, DOE um, ARPA-E are some of the the, the the funding sources that we primarily work with um, we also have internal cost share that contributed by um, GE Renewable Energy. Um, when we also look for um, other sources like um, DOE, um, uh, supercomputer, um, several DOE uh, labs offer um, not monetary um, support, but um, give you access to supercomputers if your projects involve um, like large scale um, numerical simulations that needs high end supercomputing resources. So those are all good uh, places to, to look, look into. And, and Carrie, if I may follow up. Uh, there were recently, um, Secretary uh, John Kerry was award, given an award by the Environmental League of Massachusetts. And as we all know, Secretary Kerry is gonna be the special envoy for climate for the Biden administration now. And he mentioned that there's 14 to $15 trillion in private capital worldwide uh, that's waiting for investment opportunities. And I think that's another thing that's really important. And when we think about investment opportunities, we think about a brand new industry, we think about the opportunity for innovation. This really all comes together in a way that I think people you know, have been imagining for a long time, but we haven't seen in our lifetimes. We may have seen it for iPhones and for desktop things. We haven't seen it for the biggest machines in the world that are taller than the you know Boston's Hancock Tower, 
Um, and so I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind. Another thing is, is uh, just an example on the Now RDC project, uh, another piece of this project, not directly related to the Now RDC contract, the Kingsbury family uh, actually is a fifth generation bearing manufacturer. They manufactured the original turbines for the Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam is 85 years old. Uh, they don't have any plans to tear it down anytime soon. Uh, and it turns out that the turbines in that are also the original turbines from 1935. Uh, so these journal bearings offer tremendous promise for the offshore wind industry. These are two industries that don't nec haven't necessarily uh, spoken to one another at a deep level. But part of the work that we're going to be doing with GE and ORE Catapult and our, on our work is also having this conversation about fluid film bearings. And so again, you know, this is a, some, this is a technology that exists, but if it were properly implemented in the offshore wind industry, it would represent a major innovation. And so I think, you know, we have to sort of be open and creative as we think about what does it mean to advance the technology and the innovations. Um, Great, thank you. Um, and that, that's a, uh, a great comment, you know, we, and, and someone else made it earlier as well, I, Zach, it might have been you, um, that there's so much coming into the offshore wind space from already existing industries and technology that can be adapted or modified. And um, I think I said this earlier, we're just starting to see that collaboration occur, which is, which is fantastic. You know, another example is the oil and gas industry in the Gulf. Um, and their experience with platforms and um, structural, uh, you know, really structural experience, experience with vessels, um, uh, you know, um, offshore wind maintenance using vessels and how we do that. We have a lot of work to be done uh, in the offshore wind space to, uh, you know, have those vessels be accommodated to work in the offshore wind space. So completely different area, right? You know, shipping, uh, uh, shipping services and platforms and things like that. So I'm checking our time, Amy, and I know we only have a few more minutes. So um, I'm gonna, I want to say just a couple other quick things um, because uh, our panelists made some great remarks. Um, Jane mentioned our roadmap, uh, which we will be revising this spring to reflect what we think from the consortium perspective again, which what we think we will be funding in the next solicitation. Um, it's broader than that, but it will encompass what might be funded in our next solicitation, which should be coming out later this year. But it is a broad roadmap, so that's one thing. I also encourage folks um, to look at what the states issue for their roadmap or their energy master plans. Um, they often indicate what might be needed um, on a supply chain perspective um, or from an innovation perspective. It's fairly, they're fairly high level, but they can give you some indication about what the needs are and where funding might lie. Uh, for future projects. Um, for example, uh, yesterday wasn't a roadmap announcement, but New York made a lot of big announcements yesterday. Uh, so just that's just an example of a state, you know, states often do this, New Jersey, Rhode Island, you know, um, really looking what the state policies are um, that are being passed and the announcements being made with their energy master plans or climate plans can be really helpful as well. Um, so maybe, uh, Maybe I'll just see if there's, I think we might have time for one or two questions, Amy, or am I too close to the end? I think we could do one question real quick if there's one that's... Okay, I'm gonna see if any anyone on, in our meeting right now um, wants to send a quick chat question that I might not have answered yet. Let's just see if I can... Anyone um, have anything they wanna submit and submit quickly via the chat? We'll wait one second and see if anything comes in. While we wait just for the moment, um, I'll mention that we hosted a tech symposium in November. Of course, it was virtual. Uh, but the of course part is that it actually went really well. And if you're interested in more detail about the projects you heard about today or other projects that we have funded, um, the presentations, uh, including slide decks, everything are available on our website for a year. Uh, which is great. So if you're interested in a specific technical aspect or project that the consortium is funding, please go to our website. You can review um, the actual presentations. They're about 20 minutes long each. Great way to catch up on some of the technical innovation that's occurring. Okay, let's see. Um, I have two quick questions here. Uh, well, one was a compliment, so thank you whoever gave the compliment. Um, <laughs> Okay, so these are, so I, it's kind of a detailed question, um, 
but I'll actually take a higher level one. Um, some one of our uh, participants today just asked, which, which direction is offshore wind going in the US? Is it gonna be more floating or fixed bottom? So sort of technical, but it, it might be helpful for people to hear a quick answer. And maybe Zach, I'll, I'll let you try to answer that. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think probably the cutoff line is the 60 to 90 meters area. Uh, so basically anything below 60 meter water depth is gonna be fixed. Anything above 90 is probably gonna be floating. And then there's that middle transition zone, which I think it's still up for grabs on which technology will offer the lower LCOE in that 60 to 90 meter range. Uh, so West Coast flo uh, floating, East Coast fixed for the majority. Yeah. Awesome. Great. I like your answer. It was really concise. Thanks. <laughs> All right, Amy, I think, are we, uh, are we running over our time? How are we doing on time? Are we done? Yeah. I do need to get to the next panel. However, Carrie and Zach and Professor Hines and Jing, thank Jin, thank you so much um, for joining us today. Your insights were fantastic.